slavery, racism, and the Confederacy. So our plan is on April 21st, 2021, to release our findings in the form of a first year survey report on what we will call Reconciliation Day. But between now and then, all we're trying to do is stay in contact, stay in communication, and stay in community. And that's where you come in. We're hosting this webinar or panel or town hall, if you would, as a means of making connections with the people in our neighborhood, so to speak. And so I am very delighted that joining us this evening, we have Jacinto Ramos, who's going to help us in terms of moderating a conversation about what does community look like? What is um, the North Sides, in particular in Diamond Hills, relationship with TCU and just what it is and where we want it to go, how it could be improved. And so th these are the, the, the pieces that we're, we're looking to accomplish um, in today's conversation um, as a result of our interaction. Um, it is possible for you all to uh, offer your, your questions. Um, it is uh, possible for you all to raise your hand and simply let us know if, if you'd like uh, to make a comment because this is quite organic. It's a small intimate group tonight. So hopefully we can get a chance to know one another. So without any further ado, um, even though it pains me that he is a Dallas Cowboys fan, it pains me because I'm, I'm an Eagles fan, fly, Eagle, fly. Fly, eagle, fly, right, is, is, is what I know. But despite, this, is, this, this, this lets you know just how impressive a character he is. Despite this blue star everywhere I, I go, I'm still able to see the humanity in him and, and, the, and, the, and the great work that he's doing, especially as chief of board governance and leadership um, uh, at Leadership ISD and as a TCU instructor. So ladies and gentlemen, Let's give a round of applause for Jacinto Ramos. Man, I appreciate you, Dr. G. So, you know, there, there's somebody that I see here on the participants list. A um, couple of people. I see Dr. David Trimble, principal over at uh, J.P. Elder Middle School. I see Ricky Clark, um, the, the, the guy who leads my brother's keeper and my sister's keeper. I also see uh, William Hiron from uh, the Artes de la Rosa in Northside, Funky Town, Fort Worth. Um, you know, I'm gonna go there with you, you know, Dallas Cowboys all day, every day. You know, while, while I may disagree with how much Dak is being paid, I'm hopeful, I'm hopeful just like I am in the community about what's about to happen. And, and I wanna say just, you know, naming those people um, there's this mindset that we have in our neighborhood of, you know, when, when I was coming up as a young professional, that we were not going to be cool with poverty pimps. Poverty pimps, by the way, that we did, we defined them in Northside Diamond Hill, um, especially in the work that we did, that we were not going to allow people to keep making money off of the backs of our most marginalized young people in our community. And so tonight, I look forward to the conversation about, you know, what is their impression about TCU? Um, you know, Northside Diamond Hill, I'm just going to speak bluntly. Um, you know, Northside Diamond Hill, we have gone through recent years where one year Northside received zero scholarships for community scholars. And we're talking about a community that's predominantly brown. Right. Hey, hey, real quick, can you break down what community scholars is for? for yeah, yeah. yeah, I appreciate that. So community scholars is a scholarship that's given out by TCU, you know, to young people, typically be to be young people of color that are going to receive a full ride at TCU. And so in Northside, that was a year where no young people in Northside High School got scholarships. And then there was another year when at Diamond Hill, no young people of color being being brown got scholarships and that happened during my tenure where i'm i'm a board member at fourth isd and i was pissed i'm pissed because i'm looking at you know i've been conditioned and trained to, to isolate race and so i'm looking at 
every other school district in VFW or whatever that region looks like, and Northside and Diamond Hill are one of those schools that don't get any scholarships, I'm pretty pissed off. So I'm really anxious to see what, what my neighborhood thinks about TCU, mm-hmm. especially with those parents that I visited with who are not happy that TCU, their perception was that TCU passed them over, right? And, and that these are, these are brown children, brown children, right? In that competing victimization conversation about black versus brown and indigenous and all of that. The reality is Fort Worth ISD, we're, we're 60 plus percent, 67 percent brown, right? And, and, Wait, and all of you said 67? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, Fort so, Worth ISD, so, so you're saying the math just doesn't add up. How do you have 67 percent and zero community scholars from the neighborhood? Is that what you're trying to tell me? The math doesn't add up? That's exactly what I'm saying. You know, so my frustration with, you know, competing victimization is, to be clear, when black, brown are pitted against one another and we're, and we're fighting for the crumbs, right. right? So when you're talking about Dallas, Fort Worth, really even just Texas, the majority is brown. And when brown students don't get that opportunity and it's disproportionate to white or black, it, com- it, it creates that competing victimization mentality. And so when Northside gets zero community scholars. The next year, Diamond Hill gets zero community scholars. Mm. That creates this anti-TCU sentiment. Mm. I mean, it, it's going to happen, mm. right? Like, so if, if Arlington and Dallas and all those other districts get so many Black children that get the TCU scholarship, it creates this mindset of what's going on. Like, because let's be real. SMU is not given the same kind of scholarships to Fort Worth or Tarrant County the way TCU has been given to Dallas County kids. And so the, 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 the methodology, right, the, the ideology, the whole mindset of why in the world are we giving so many scholarships to Arlington and Dallas County kids when SMU is not reciprocating that, that creates a problem. And that adds to the narrative of, you know, anti-Black sentiment, mm-hmm. anti-TCU sentiment. Mm-hmm. So when brown kids get omitted from the, the one, some of the biggest parts of Fort Worth, that's what I want to hear about tonight. That's what I want to talk about. I don't want TCU to get off easy tonight when we're talking about that conversation. So okay. when I see Ricky on the call and I see William and I see other people's on this call. Okay. I want to hear from them tonight. No, we, we, no let's, let's definitely do that. And but before we open up, you know, the, the lines, if we just go back to one piece that you said, I think which was pretty powerful, this idea of competitive victimization. So w- w- what have you seen in terms of some of the best strategies to combat this? Because you're right, black and brown end up fighting for crumbs. We're still talking about crumbs, but yet, um, you know, this idea of lateral violence, right? This idea that black and brown are going at one another. The idea is that the power dynamic still remains relatively undisturbed, that is with whites at the top. And so what, what are some of your thoughts on how do we advocate for our communities or just advocate for that which is right in general? For example, I mean, you know, all you have to do is be a human being on the planet to agree that George Floyd was murdered. It, it doesn't matter whether you're Latinx, whether you're Chicano, whether, whether you're, you know, where, you know, it doesn't matter where you're from, he was murdered and we all get it and it should not have happened. But, but, but how do we advocate for that which is right and advocate for our communities without doing it at the expense of others, right? So, oh, look at the, 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 what the black community got. You know, that's not fair because, so in other words, how, how do we advocate without putting like other groups down that are also equally as oppressed you know i mean yeah what are some of your thoughts on that man so, so so some of my basic thoughts are the research the research that i have reviewed of why anti-blackness exists in the brown community okay let's talk about it. It, it it's a little it's a little oversimplified um 
when when Black Lives Matter happens, the brown community is wondering, well, maybe I'm light skinned enough to not have to deal with that. So if a black man gets killed or a black woman gets killed, I'm light skinned enough that maybe I can get away with it here and there. And so in that conversation is that criminal justice system reform and all of that. The, the brown community, the, the conscious brown community is looking at, does the black community care about when we are being, when, when, when we're being held at, in cages at the border? Immigration reform, right? right? And, and I myself have lived in a space where black people say, man, you know what? You, you all need to go back to Mexico. You all need to go back to wherever that is. So that whole competing victimization, who has mm -hmm. it worse, right? Right, right? So the brown community is looking for the black community to say, I want you to care about those kids that are in cages at the border. Mm -hmm. And right now with Governor Abbott, you know, rolling up, you know, at, 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 at those conversations of, you know, too many brown people are coming over, they're getting caught at the border, all of that, that whole, that whole conversation. The brown community, the conscious brown community is looking to the black community to say, stand with us, stand in solidarity with us. The black community, in my experience from, from my boy Ricky and others who have said, hey man, well, we're getting freaking killed on the streets. We're being mm -hmm. murdered on the mm -hmm. streets. Mm -hmm. It's not too different from when you all get murdered. If we can connect those pieces, mm -hmm. immigration and police mm -hmm. brutality, mm -hmm. look man, brown people are treated like crap the same way with by law enforcement, systemically mm -hmm. and all of that, the way the black community is. Mm -hmm. Definitely there's disparities on what that looks like. But in education, for me, brown people are being kicked out of school systems more than black people, but black people are being more severely punished than, right. than brown people. Okay. If okay. we can make those connects, right. that's what's scary. I think yeah. for, for, for a systemic racism, for a systemic racism, I think that's what's scary. That if black and brown find that common ground, okay. it's game over. So you're saying we have yet to truly tap into our potential as a unified people. Yep. That, that is powerful. Speaking of, speaking of unified, I, I think it's about time we open pieces up. Uh, Brother Perkins, Marcellus Perkins, are you with us? I wanted to bring in, um, you know, when we talk about youth and education, uh, I wanted to bring in um, th this dynamic brother. He's our graduate research assistant and um, he's been with us every step of the way. Um, and he can, at, at the end, talk about, you know, the podcast that he's launched as a result. But Ms. Perkins, you, you, you said you had a particular question for uh, Mr. Ramos before, before we open it up. Yeah, yeah. Well, my, my question was geared towards um, when you have a school like TCU, predominantly white school whose social economic status or identity uh, does not reflect the city in which it belongs, uh, there, there comes a sense of um, superiority that TCU students or TCU faculty staff or anyone associated with TCU just gets blanketed into. Uh, whereas members of the Fort Worth community don't see that their identity is reflected, as you stated, in the student body, faculty, staff, or, or admissions. Um, but but also the school likes to commu do community outreach in which student groups, organizations think that they're servicing the community by going out and volunteering, which, which could be done with good intent, but also can be very uh, um, paternalistic, uh, patronizing, um, very uh, white savior complex, identity based. So from your experience as, as a community member leader in the Fort Worth community, uh, how might those that want to be engaged in the Fort Worth community do so in a more authentic way that doesn't come off as I'm here to save you from your uh, situation or experience? Yeah, so the the white savior complex mentality for me is like a real deal, man. So it's kind of like it's it's the way we started. It's I don't believe in that poverty pimp mentality. Uh, and when I say that, it's nonprofits and and organizations that come in to save black and brown communities. I want to know what's the end date. When are you done? Right. And when when have you met your objective and your goal? 
And if, if you don't have a date in mind, you know, five, seven years, whatever that is, then you're probably by definition a poverty pit mentality. And, and, and the reason that I say that is there are plenty of white people making a middle to upper class living off of our communities. I have a problem with that. And I, and I learned that through the weed and seed program like 10, 15 years ago. So Hasin, so what would be an example of people who are making money off our communities? Like, is it through these nonprofits? Is it through like these consulting agencies? Or what would be an example to make it tangible for the people? Yeah, so, I mean, I don't, I don't want to name any. I, I, I just want to give you the characteristics. Okay. Right? This is a nonprofit or a for-profit who comes into XYZ neighborhood and says, we're going to save all of these young people and families. But they don't have an end date. And so they've been in our communities 10, 15, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. Mm. And the CEOs are a bunch of white people mm. who sit there and spill this whole, we're going to save black and brown kids. We're going to save, you know, I mean, there's coding, there's coded language of we're going to save all these low socioeconomic kids. We're going to save these at risk kids. Gotcha. I, have a, I have a problem with that. If you don't have an end date in mind, so think about it, right? The for-profit business, they come in, like, we're going to get this problem resolved. We'll be out of your hair in five years. Nonprofits and community-based programs, they do not operate that way. They operate on this mindset of white board members, white CEOs, hmm. and predominantly white, you know, uh, social workers or community organizers who don't really have a feel for the polls, but they do have access to the monies. I have a problem with that. So what I learned in Weed and Seed when I was doing that in Northside mm. was we had this mindset from people in Philadelphia who said, get rid of the poverty pimps. That's the real way of addressing the issues in your community. Ask people before you give them money, what is your timeline? When are you done? Gotcha. And if they don't, then they really don't have an end result in mind. And for what we do in governance in Fort Worth ISD and the school districts that we're promoting is, we have a tagline that says, student outcomes won't change until adult behaviors change. And the reality is that there's plenty of adults making a lot of money and making a good living off mm -hmm. of pimping out our young people in our communities. Mm -hmm. I, have a, I have a problem with that. Okay. And so, and going back to Perkins' question, if TCU says it wants a better relationship with the community, like, what, it seems as if there's a lot of danger of repeating a lot of what you talked about, right? You know, in terms of the way, you know, they approach business. And so, I mean, how does like a sincere relationship get constructed? You know, what does that look like? So to me, a sincere relationship is like, I, I saw a gentleman that's on here named Bill West. Mm. Bill, Bill, Bill West, Bill, 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 West. Bill West isn't a, he's not a white ally. He's a white co-conspirator. Co hmm. And so when, you know, the anti-racist work is an ally, you know, may do something here or there. A co-conspirator is going to infiltrate the system and redirect it. Hmm. So knowing that Bill West is on this call right now, to me, he's a co-conspirator. And I see that as TCU has been a predominantly white institution who, to me, is on a fast track of trying to do a lot of good, hiring people like Bill West. But I'm going to keep it real. Bill, don't get mad at me. Bill got pimped out for a little while. Mm -hmm. and all the knowledge, all the contacts, all the people that he's had. The only reason that I teach at TCU is because of Bill West, because he was a co-conspirator. Mm -hmm. And he said, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna to create the space for people of color to get into this, 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 this university system to redirect it quickly, right? So to me, a Bill West is, is a co-signer for getting TCU to get credibility to say, we're going to do right for all the right reasons. And as much as I may not like it, it takes white people to do that work to be co-conspirators wow. who are, are going to move a predominantly white institution mm -hmm. 
to listen to a white person to say, mm -hmm. this is the right way to go. Because as much as I want to argue against it, I didn't have positional power or influence until Bill West gave me that co-signing to do it. Okay. Well, speaking of which, I mean, um, what, what do you say, Hassan? Should we open it up a little bit? I mean, I know you've mentioned a couple names that you wanted to hear from. I mean, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm easy, right? Like, what, Lana, what you say? Like on a Sunday morning, you know what I'm saying? So, I mean, you know, uh, however we want to go about it is good. I mean, you said we didn't see from Philly, so, um, you know, that that, make, that makes sense to me. You know, so I mean, how how, how we want how we want to work it? You know, I mean, let, let's hear from the people, right? Yeah. Question in the chat. Sure. If you want me to read it out. So we oh, can... oh, go ahead. Okay. Um, so we have a question: How can we unite our groups to where we come together in numbers and not in competitive victimization manner? How can we truly mobilize, tap into our brown and black populations? So let me ask you this, right? Because I'm a relatively a newcomer, same with Perkins. We're both from the East Coast, right? You know, it's just, you know. So, but that being said, it's difficult for us outsiders to get a feel because, I mean, it's, you have the East Side, right? East of 35, then you have like the North Side, then you have like Crowley. I mean, you have, you have like these pockets. And then, you know, my understanding is that virtually all of downtown is owned by like two families, ha ha, he he, that sort of deal. So like in terms of the layout, how much does geography play a part into these potential separations, um, you know, in, along the lines of the question that was just asked as far as us being able to bridge that? How much does geography you think play a role? I mean, to me, to me, knowing the history of Fort Worth and the redlining and how we got to where we're at, I mean, you just got to watch the board meeting last night from Fort Worth ISD and hear my brother Q, Quentin Phillips, mm -hmm. talk about what his experience was in Stop Six and then becoming a school board member. Mm -hmm. Like, there's a lot of history, especially related to redlining, on how we are where we are and how much of a disconnect there is between people sitting in positional power and influence and not knowing that history. So to me, it's a real conversation about the history of redlining, the history of how black and brown have, pitted, have been pitted against one another mm. and how we don't get to those bottom lines. Mm. So for me, it's usually, I gotta start with that history, right? Mm. And, and as much as people wanna say, well, I went to school for history, but you got a whitewashed version of that history. Right. You weren't given the you weren't given the tools. So, like when I met Malcolm X's daughter, she said the master won't give you his or her tools to undo right. the housing right, right. Of, of the community. Right. They're not going to give you the tools to dismantle the systemic racism that surrounds us. Right. So for me, the competing victimization is. Luckily, I was trained by a guy like Ricky Clark. I was trained by the black community and given the tools of this racial identity of understanding how race, you know, was, was designed to pit us against one another. Mm. And, and it also is, there's a whole nother level to that. Mm. I don't, I don't want to hate white people. Okay. I don't want to be mad at white people. Okay. What I do want to do is I want to be mad at, I want to be mad at white systems. Mm. I want to be mad at white systems and understand how white systems were designed to pit us against one another, even conscious white people. So in, in my heart, there's this space for white people. But what is not in my heart is this space for white people that have bad intentions for further dividing us. I have a problem with that. You know, I mean, I think what you said is so very powerful because it shows that despite the wrongs, despite the deficiencies, you're still focused on this larger idea of the system and, and not you know, focusing and channeling on individuals as far as, you know, hating individuals. Cause you know, one thing I've never understood is how, um, you know, when you look at some of the racial violence, you know, that um, most of our communities have experienced, it's just, it's just irrational to me. Like what would make somebody like, uh, you know, haul off and just, you know, physically attack somebody because of their race. It just doesn't make any sense. But yet what you're telling me is something different. You're saying like, no, I'm not, I'm not gonna walk around with the grudge all day. That's holding me down. I'm not mad at the system in the way it's not operating correctly, but you know, I, I got you know my eyes on you know big, bigger goals, and I think that's that's a spiritual maturity that I think 
um, our people have. And I think that's something we just need to emphasize and, and build up because when you talk about the history, you're right. I, I was very grateful. Speaking of Wild Bill, you know, Walter West, uh, very grateful, you know, when I first came to Fort Worth, you know, to be able to meet him because then I was able to meet you. You know, you took me around, showed me some, you know, some people, was able to meet Q, like you said, Quentin Phillips, was able to meet Ricky Clark. And so, you know, I was able to meet, you know, the actual names and faces, you know, in the neighborhood. Speaking of Ricky Clark, um, you know, Brother Clark, would you mind um, taking off your camera and just sharing a little bit about what you said? Because I think you dropped a, a very important gem in the, uh, in the chat. You said something about you have to love the people to lead the people. What, what, what do you mean by that, my brother? Is, is he gone? Oh, he has to uh, be invited to be a panelist, I believe. Yeah. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. We can't, oh, really? Oh, I thought, I thought it was like open um, Q&A, right? No, he, he has to be allowed in. I got him. Here it is. Is Rick? it? Hello. There you go. Hello, hello. Show, show your face, Rick. It won't yeah. let me show my face. Can you hear me? <laughs> <laughs> it's Probably the conspiracy. Different. The conspiracy. But go ahead. We can hear you. Right. Yeah, that's what it is. Y'all are the conspiracy. So what would be the question? So can you can you explain what you uh, meant when you said you have to love the people to lead the people? I said that based on what Sinto had said earlier when he made the comment about poverty fence. And you talked about the community. In order to um, lead the people, you got to love the people. But in order to love the people, you got to know the people. You can't love something you don't know nothing about. So oftentimes in our community or even with people within the community, we're talking about I love black people, I like brown people, but do you know anything about black people? Do you know anything about brown people? So the first thing we want to move to is the term race. But it ain't the, it's not just race. As Sinto always say, race is a construct used to separate people. It's the culture. They don't understand the culture of the people. And culture human beings like fish to water. To love me is to understand my culture. Better yet, to overstand my culture. So overstanding my culture would say, as Africans, we honor and respect our mother. As Africans, we honor our teachers. We respect our neighborhood. We believe in the land. Those are cultural things. But we've created this Eurocentric mentality that is always opposite of that. So as we as a people, for us, to, I think, as an I statement for Black or Brown people, for anybody, first thing you got to do is go back. I think you said it, Brett, Mr. G, history. You got to go back. When did all this start? Hell, I went to the doctor yesterday to get my annual checkup. You know what they wanted to know? Well, the, well, tell me about your daddy. Tell me about your mama. Did your mama have this? Did your brother have that? Before he even worked on me, he wanted to know my history, my medical history. They won't even work on you. Well, if you want to come to my community and you see some illness, ain't that the first thing you want to know? Is the history of the people? So that's why I say that. You got to love the people to lead the people. No, no, I appreciate that. I, I really do. Um, you know, and I think you make a good point. Uh, it's hard to, 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 to love somebody if you just don't know them, you know? And, and I think that, um, I think when we talk about an institution like TCU, um, it has a lot of resources, but I think where it often falls short is the social capital. We talk about that resource, right? You know, so there's this idea that, um, you know, I, that's what I was saying earlier, like so close, but yet so far TCU, is synonymous with the word Fort Worth, right? When you think about its influence and, and impact, um, you know, one of the largest schools in the area, but yet, you know, I, I'm just still mystified, you know, and, and that's why I wanna, you know, dig into a little bit, you know, the time we have left. Like, wh wh why do we think like TCU has been so isolated from communities? Why, why has it been so difficult? If TCU is like right smack dab in the center of the, of, of the city, like, I don't know. Not to interrupt you. What's, what's the history in that? But what I've seen, and I've been here for a minute, I, I go to these schools and, and, and Central can testify. You ask most of those kids in middle school, high school, what college are you going to go to? That's one of the questions we had, TCU, TCU, but they've never even been on the campus. Hmm. So it's not in some areas, it's not even just, it's in walking distance. You got kids at Daggett Middle School who've never been on TCU campus. You got kids in our community who've never been on the campus. It's in the neighborhood. And the world talks about TCU when they went in and all that. You live in the city. So what I say, if you can't, if they can't um, get to the campus, shouldn't you take the campus to them? If you want to include them? So if I was in TCU and I really cared about the people in the community, 
Why we don't have a satellite school right there, on, or right there in the South Six? Why don't have a satellite school right there on the North Side? Right there in the neighborhood. Imagine what would happen if TCU held a class over in the building. I mean, we got space. Hmm. What if they held a class at Dunbar? Hmm. They don't even come across 35. Hmm. What's that thing about Scary Mary? They not coming oh, over there. Oh, man, that's terrible. I mean, so if you thinking like that, and let's give you even better than that. You learn this while you on campus. Hell, let me change that. You on campus talking about you love black people, you love black people, but you won't even go in the hood. Bill brings young folks over there, and I love that about Bill. Sento said that he is an ally. They come through, they'll come to the dock shop, they'll go to the north side, he does the tour. And I don't want to keep you all, but if TC, this is an asset. I believe if TCU really wanted to reach out to the community, you go to the people. And there's a saying, Kwame Nkrumah says, go to the people, live mm -hmm. amongst them, learn from them, plan mm -hmm. with them, start mm -hmm. with what they have mm -hmm. and build on what you know. There's no reason why any of those schools in Dallas and Arlington could have these many scholarships and we right here at TCU, I mean, Fort Worth, mm -hmm. and you skip. One year you're gonna go to give it a diamond hill, next year you're not. One day you're gonna give it to Easton Hill. There's a lot of schools that they don't even go in there. Mm. Oh, they, they won't even go in Easton Hills, bro. Mm. Ain't no community scholars over there. Hell, I know community scholars. Mm. So if you really wanted to do it, take it to the people. Don't have the people come to you. Yeah. So, first of all, uh, thank you, Brother Ricky, uh, for sharing. Thank you for allowing me to share. No, 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 that's all good. I mean, I, I, I'm just curious. Is there anybody else who wants to build upon what Brother Ricky Clark is, is saying? I mean, um, you know, I, I know I'm stimulated. I just don't want to talk and dominate. I, I want to hear from some other voices. Yeah, but, I actually had, had a follow-up question to that. And, um, you know, obviously you want people in the group chat, they may have more insight on this. Is, is there a um, an unwelcoming feeling uh, for those high school, middle school kids to even walk through on campus? Um, I mean, like Dr. Like G said, I didn't go to undergrad here at TCU. I, I came here. 2019 was the first time I even came to Fort Worth. That was the first time I came to TCU. Didn't visit the campus, didn't visit, visit the city. I, I just got an opportunity, I came. But one thing I noticed is that I don't see a lot of uh, high school or middle school kids <laughs> walking around on campus. Oh, I mean, no. It's, it's a pretty much open campus. You know, like, no one's stopping you to say, like, hey, what are you doing here? But I guess there's a fear being that the student population doesn't reflect that of the city, doesn't look like me. I mean, I, every time I walk on campus, someone asks me if I'm an athlete. This happens all the time. So I can assume that other high school kids or middle school kids can, can feel as if though they don't necessarily belong on campus. Right so I want to know if, if that is the kind of general consensus of a lot of the Fort Worth community members that they don't belong on campus. What is on your campus? I'm interrupting. What's on the campus that reflect people of color, especially Black people? I'm, I'm an isolate race. Name something on TCU campus that reflect Africans or Africans born in America. Football. Give me one thing. Yeah. I'll wait. Football. Yeah. In, in the basketball. Come on, man. Outside of sports and entertainment. <laughs> <laughs> and even the football don't reflect them. You see they trophies in there, but you don't see anything. There's no building that had none of those stars name on it. Not one of them stars that came from TCU got a spot on TCU campus, not a trophy. None of, I mean, they might have a trophy inside the trophy case, but tell me a place, a building. Hell, they may have not one of them named after a black person. Name anything on TCU campus that would attract people of color. I'll wait. So, so I'm gonna add another one, right? Like we're gonna isolate, we're gonna keep isolating race. It's like race. And and this whole competing victimization, right? Like Northside is predominantly brown. Yes. <laughs> Mexican, indigenous, immigrant. And and so, you know, at least at least there's a football, maybe basketball. There's not even a men's soccer team. Wow. Which I, I, think, know that. I think maybe we would have a shot at, right? But if we're gonna keep isolating race, and this is what I'm saying, this is where the keep competing victimization conversation comes from. It's how does the brown community show value to TCU? And 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 if it's not, and all I got to do is look at the Greek life, which you know, Rick, you don't have a problem with the Greek life because I do too. I'm not Greek. 
<laughs> so let's go there right quick, Dr. G. Rick, Rick, why do I have a problem with the Greek life from, from your perspective? You taught me. Well, because the Greeks didn't start it. And if you go and study the history of the divine, now, no, you started it, Sinto. You sent me over there to Eastern Hills to speak to the Lambdas, and I've never seen 500 Mexicans with degrees in my life all at one time. And then when I get over there, they telling me they want to know about Alpha. And I'm saying, why do you want to learn about Alpha? We talking Greek shit. Excuse that. We ain't Greeks. And if you study the history of the Divine Nine, I happen to be a member of Alpha by Alpha. We know for a fact that the information that they had was information stolen from the chapter of the white chapters and modified to fit us. And we start talking about the Greeks, but listen to this part. Plato, Pythagoras, Socrates, we taught them, they didn't teach us. So why we walk around here saying I'm Greek and when I'm on there, they'd be like, almost no, I'm not no damn Greek, do I look white to you? So no, look at the canvases, even those Greek fraternities are trying to be like those black Greek fraternities are trying to be like white people. And so Brother Clark makes a very um, important point in that the libraries of Alexandria were burned. And so yes. it is a historical fact that um, the great Western civilizations, you know, Greeks and Romans, they all learned from Egyptians. And Egyptians, as you can tell by the hieroglyphics behind me, uh, are located in the continent of Africa. So this Middle East is a fabrication. I mean, it's in the continent of Africa. You can check your map, Egypt. And again, if you have the opportunity to go there, I'm not trying to you know, humble brag, but if you have the opportunity to go there, you can look in the walls and you'll see that there are paintings Right, and you'll see that the paintings are like thousands of years old. And also you'll notice that they had white paint available to them <laughs> because you know, they, they painted you know, the, the dresses and things of that nature. And what's fascinating is they depicted themselves That's as right. black and brown people. I mean, so you tell me what was going on. I don't know, you know uh, what the technology was back in the day. But <laughs> if they're looking at their own arms, I mean, uh, and figuring out this is what we want to reflect, then that tells you something. So again, all we want to do is like tell that whole story. And, and actually the comments, um, you know, remind me of um, what George Fillon um, put in the chat, this idea that excellence is the exception rather than the rule. And so, you know, when you talk about Jacinto, you said TC needs to understand the value. Well, well, you said something about how do brown people show their value to TC. I'm thinking, well, I think we can ask questions both ways in terms of how does TC appreciate the value of what's happening in our local communities? because. This is a, a you know a scab that that you know I would like to pick. I've, I've been saying for the longest time that the cure for cancer is where Perkins. Where I say it is, it's in the hood. Somewhere in the ghetto. Yeah. It's somewhere in the ghetto, and we're never going to know because why we don't go look, um, you know, to these neighborhoods because we're you know we're looking elsewhere else, you know. And the fact of the matter is, is if anything, um, if anything, when you talk about grit, you know, the book by Angela Duckworth. You talk about this idea of tenacity, what it takes to succeed in life. If anything, you, we should start with, uh, you know, the or the ghetto first in terms of these people know how to think, right? I mean, it, 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 this is what you want. I mean, people who know how to think, right? Who are constantly observing the situation and trying to figure out how to do better. That, that's who you want in your team. Just yeah. that simple. Not somebody who's going to follow a script, you know, to the letter and run into a wall. And so I'm, I'm thinking that there's plenty of opportunity where it could be a win-win situation. I see those you about to say something. Yeah. So look, man, I mean, again, I'm, I'm, I'm going to give a lot of love to Rick right here. Who's vice versa. Thank, thankfully on, right? Like if I, if I had not understood the origin of man, woman, if I had not understood the struggle of a black person and how that relates to me, I don't think that I could have ever signed up for fighting for black people in black Amer in, in black America. If I had only been conditioned and thought of in white or brown people, which to me, so much of brownness comes from white people. And the only evidence that I have right now is on, on the census, it's going to say, are you white Caucasian, right? You know, white, white, or are you white? Hispanic, like I'm, I'm, I'm completely okay with knowing, not okay. I, I know where that comes from, that brown people are being socialized and conditioned to think that we're white enough and assimilate, right? 
And so because I've been mentored and taught by a black man named, named Ricky Clark, who sits right here, I've been given the origins of humanity and when race became a social construct and why it became a social construct. And I remember when Rick told me years ago, over two decades ago, when Ricky Clark said, hey, did you know that one of the wise men was a Moor and the Moor was a black man? It blew my mind. So as a Roman Catholic, I'm thinking, man, I've studied you know, Christianity since I was in third grade never heard that one of the three wise men was a black man never heard of the moors or who they were or what they came what they were about if i had not been mentored by a black man i would still have anti-blackness in my skin and everything that i do right now you know when you mention the moors um their story is very powerful and it's undertold especially when you look at what they did in granada in the iberian peninsula in spain but going back to something you said earlier do you think, I mean, you, you, you observe colorism to be uh, something that's attacking the brown community in terms of, um, you know, I mean, are you know, people trying to, I guess, play their cards. I mean, you know, maybe benefit from the privilege that comes with lighter skin, but then at the same time, hey, check it out. My last name's Hernandez, you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, like, you know, don't, don't forget, I'm part of the struggle too. Have, have you, you seen colorism play out in your community? Oh, yeah, yeah, 24 seven, so. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, so I, I'm trying to I'm trying to constantly check my anti-blackness because of how I was socialized, right? That the black community is one way. I'm in the valley right now in South Texas. I'm picking up anti-blackness 24/7. I'm picking up anti-brownness right now. Like we have brown people down here on the border, right? Doing the whole immigration deal, being border patrol agents school board members, elected officials, and have this whole mindset of they can't come into this country. And yet I'm asking them, one or two generations ago, where were you at? Oh yeah, no, we were undocumented as well. Okay, like, so what does that mean for you? Right, so it's, just, it's, it's, it's what I'm talking about with Ricky and everybody else, uh, James Baldwin, when he talks about what do you, you know, when are you taking, when are you taking a bribe? How often do you take the bribe? And people of color, and he, he was actually specifically talking to black people when he was being asked, are you with the Black Panther Party or are you with Dr. Martin Luther King? And even knowing that Dr. Martin Luther King wasn't loved during that time, but he understood the difference. So James Baldwin was like, I'm not gonna turn my back, back on the Black Panther Party because I know what they're doing. Even when white America was promising him the Nobel Peace Prize, all of these awards and accolades, and James Baldwin was like, I'm a, I'm a black gay man. There's no way I'm gonna freaking turn my back on it. So I know how white America typically tries to reward us. And I'm just saying for the brown people in the brown community, because we're lighter skinned, there's more opportunities for us. And I'm not okay with that. And the only reason, well, the main reason I'm okay with that is because people like Ricky invested in me and said, look, this is the origin of man and woman. This is where we come from. We all come from the continent of Africa. This is, this is what it means for us. This is how race was socially constructed. This is how Johan Blumenbach and Christoph Miners made it a cool thing, right? And if I didn't have that as my basis, I, I would have a lot of anti-blackness in me still right now. And so that's the power of the history and telling the full story. I'd like to have Brother Clark respond to you, but in the meantime, I would just like to put out, uh, if anyone has a comment or a question, by all means, put it in the chat. Um, you know, we would still like to hear, what do people think about TCU? You know, from your perspective, where, where you situate, like, you know, tell us what part of town you're from, let us know what, what you think about TCU so we, we can get to that. Uh, Brother Clark, you seem like you wanted to respond to Brother Ramos. We have a question regarding that. Right? I was actually uh, agreeing with them. Oh, okay, you agree. Uh, Perkins, what, what's the question then, Brother? Yeah, um, so we have a question. What is TCU doing to disrupt and dismantle whiteness, white supremacy, and institutional racism at all levels? That, that's a... That's a pretty, that's a big question. Can I offer Dr. G? Oh, my brother. So uh, 
with the Race and Reconciliation Initiative that we're doing here at TCU, uh, which Dr. G stated in the beginning, uh, this is a research initiative where we are looking into the history of TCU and in regards to enslavement, in regards to uh, segregation, desegregation, and contemporary nouns. And, and, and the power in studying history is that you uncover that these incidents aren't happening in vacuums, but they're a systematic behavior, reaction, and response from a very concentrated thing. Power is the ability to define a phenomenon and make it act in, in a desired manner. I'll say it again, power is the ability to define a phenomenon and make it act in a desired manner. Now, a lot of times when we, we look at institutions and systems, we see the effects of power, but we don't truly understand the roots of power. So with this research initiative, we're understanding the roots of TCU's power in that we can critique it. Because when you critique things without transparency, it's hard to hold it accountable. I can't hold you accountable to who I think you should be. I can hold you accountable to who you are, who you've shown me to be in your past and present. In that, we can reconstruct the new future. So that's kind of where we're starting. And this is the work that we're doing. This is why we're doing it. What TCU is doing at an admin level, that they, they put the money behind. And, and, and our research project is geared towards looking at all aspects of race. Uh, this first year is looking primarily with uh, Black and African American history. In, in following years, we'll, we'll look at uh, Hispanic and, and Native American uh, and Brown population and how that has interacted with TCU. Um, but using that same formula of uncovering the roots of power in that we can create a new future and hold it, hold it accountable to, to the, to the uh, identity that it said it is. So Marcellus, let me add to that. I mean, you talk about a new, it's already there. I'm a graduate of Jarvis Christian College in East Texas. What mm -hmm. does Jarvis have to do with TCC? Uh, Everything. Yeah, yeah, we know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Act so like you got the oil wells on yeah. Jarvis campus pumping and the money goes to TCU. Mm. Jarvis is raggedy as heck. TCU look really good. And mm. on TCU campus, there's a building that says Jarvis building. Yes. Some of you all might be in it already. So we saying on one hand, this is what we want to do. And I'm glad that y'all there because it's got to start somewhere. So I would hope that you all are doing that. And that's why they brought you there. But even knowing that, they would say, this is an asset that look good, but just like Sento said, what's the end result? What's the end date? And I know you ain't a poverty pimp, hmm. but they didn't put the money in there. What's the end date? And what would it look like when you finish? Hmm. I'll wait. Yeah. No, no, I, I think that's a valid question. Um, Dr. G, as our chair, um, we say that we're building as we climb. Like they gave us this position, they, they put the money in our pocket. Um, so we're creating a formula as we go on. When is our end date? Our final report comes out 421, which included to that report the full on start study and the amount of recommendations that we'll compile uh, looking at other institutions. There's 60 other schools that are part of this research project as well across the world. So we're looking at their recommendations, what they've done, and how successful their recommendations have, have come. So we compile that with our research. We hand it over to the powers that be. And then we say that we've done the work, we've done the study, we've done the recommendations. Now it's on, on your end to implement it. We, as you know, Dr. G, Race Reconciliation Initiative, we, we're not the magic wand to, right. to change the system, right? What, what we are doing is trying to uncover the, the historical patterns of that system to provide new solutions and recommendations moving forward. And also to, first of all, let me just state that um, you, you understand why I'm so high on this brother and that's the power of education because truly um, this young man was blessed with the gifted family that gave him this idea that he is somebody. And so I, I just want you all to know if you're listening and watching that Mr. Marcellus Perkins is indeed the reason why we do this. He is our future. And I'm um, just, I can be prouder just to listen to this young man in terms of him just being tight with his game, you know what I'm saying? I mean, this, this is what we want. So amen, you know, and thank you, uh, Mr. Perkins for that. And I just want to add on to what Perkins said to state that what we are trying to do is make the we as big as possible. Because you, as you all know, in, in terms of power is always a small group of people that end up making decisions that affect the, you know, the masses of us, right? And you know, TCU is no different from BCU, GCU, or you know, you know, FCU, right? So the idea is that you know, 
TCU is trying to maintain his brand and is trying to, you know, maintain its livelihood and, you know, and it's been doing that quite well, you know, and, and, and planning for his future. And so let's be honest, I think that some of this is a nature of uh, convenience, right? You know, in terms of if TCU doesn't adhere to public, the court of public opinion and make efforts to be more sensitive, it's, it will do so at its own peril. Right. So in many ways, this is strategic in terms of the institution figuring out what it needs to do to survive. I think there are, um, you know, um, signs that there is sincerity from various aspects. But as we know, it's a process. Um, you know, progress is a process. And so it's not going to happen overnight. And, um, you know, in the, the prevailing narratives and attitudes that brought it to, brought us to this point to where TCU is viewed as a country club for exclusively white influence. Um, that's not going to change anytime soon because that's not, I mean, because just looking at the constitution of what TCU is right now, right? But that being said, to the extent that we can make the we as big, as diverse, as complex as possible, I think that it will be a very important lever in terms of us creating the pressure to continue the, the, the work that has been done up to this point. Because I don't think we're unique. I, I think over the years, there have been committees, there have been you know, various groups of individuals, whether it be professors or students or staff who have come together and said, what do we need to do to make matters better? So we're not unique in that respect. Um, maybe what's different is that there's this idea of um, you know, a public spotlight. And so you know, if there's a bit more of a performance aspect to this because you know, eyes are watching and we've said publicly that we're committed to this, well, what, let's not take advantage of this window in terms of all eyes are looking, then the, the question is, we issued a report on 421, but what happens on 422? That's right. Right, you know, our eyes are still looking at you. You said you wanted this report. Now the question is, what did you say you really wanted to do? Do you really want the diversity that you said you want? So Dr. G, I mean, I think to honor that space is for me, one of the main things that Courageous Conversations About Race taught me was to hold the space. And I think the holding the space would be, I would love to hear a quick, a quick, you know, thought process of, of TCU from Adelia, you know, that's on, that's on here. Um, like I put on a chat box, yeah. uh, Juan Daniel Garcia, William Hiron, you know, William, William is a big community leader in, you know, just, I, I would love to hold the space to hear from Brown people you know, Northside, Diamond Hill, what are their thoughts about TCU? So hate to put them on the spot, but then I kind of really don't, you know, just love to see a quick version of, you know, for you to capture it and see see what their thoughts are about TCU. The yeah. doors of the church are op is open. So Mr. Perkins, are, are you able to adjust the settings so that people can jump on in? Um, yeah, I got it. All right. So Right, whoever's name was, was called by all means, feel free to, to jump one in and join the conversation. Thanks for the invitation, y'all. I am uh, currently drive, not driving, I'm a passenger, but uh, so I'll keep the video off. But um, the conversations that need to happen, I think the initiative to have these conversations is there, but the actions to follow up and to have quality um, time and effort towards what needs to be done to support this is what's lacking. Um, a few of the comments, like just looking at that, when I think back on like community scholars and um, Diamond Hill on Northside, I, I see a lot of programs or schools where the schools, the students uh, are like pretty trained on how to interview well. And I feel like some of our schools and that that need the support don't have that similar support. Um, and so that's, that's, that's one like real world example where I could use and look at that. But even thinking on my time as a student, um, and I've voiced this a few times, but of course, uh, ad addressing it is difficult because of the perceptions of other people. But um, when I was a student, I always wondered, I was, I was a resident assistant. And so I get to have a leadership role within the residence halls. Um, but there was one person um, on the whole staff that looked like me. And I remember that one person, they were there maybe until I graduated, a year after I graduated. But since then, someone who looks like me has not been replaced on the staff. 
there are plenty of um, people of color or brown people on the housekeeping staff that clean the residence halls and that do a lot of cleaning with, for the school, but not in roles of leadership. The hierarchical um, type of positional power structure uh, is not there in other systems. That's just a little piece of it, but it's just some case examples. Something that I, I witnessed as a student and that I'm, I mean, I'm here wanting to make change, see change happen. And of course, it's not something that's gonna happen overnight. You have to move the needle. Um, but at the same time, we can't just give this checklist type effort where we can check a box and say, all right, we did this, we're good to go. Um, I always wonder all the time, you know, if there weren't awards for diversity, if there weren't funding uh -huh. behind things, uh -huh. um, where would we be with our efforts if there wasn't uh, media out there highlighting issues or problems? Where would we really, our true intentions lie? That's an excellent point, Ariella. And, um, you know, you remind me, I, I just put in the link to our website. Um, this goes for you, Ariella, and anybody else. Um, feel free to email us so we can have your contact information when we talk about the idea to follow up and follow through. I mean, this is hopefully how we can start to sow those seeds, right? You know, in terms of connecting spaces like this and staying connected as we move towards um, reconciliation. So I'll also allow me to invite anyone who's within earshot that any and everyone is invited to 421 Reconciliation Day. Um, the plan is to hold it on campus, socially distant, you know, what, regardless of what Abbott says. But um, we would love for you to share this date with the community so that we can, you know, continue to make this a work in progress, right? You know, it's, it's, not, it's not to say that we're done, but we want to still foster, as Jacinto said, spaces by which we're able to come together so we can move forward together. Speaking of which, uh, would William, uh, Dr. Trumbull, or Juan like to also jump in? Yes, if I could. Um, I was thinking about what you guys were saying. I come from a little bit older version of Northside and uh, Diamond Hill and Loma and Rock Island. It's now been gentrified, good old Fort Worth. Um, TCU basically, when I was growing up, was that was the side of the, you drove through it, but you sure as hell didn't stop. Uh, I've been on campus a few times and I know people are looking at me like, oh, he's got to be going to maintenance or like Ariel said, or he's got to go over to custodial or he's doing something, right? He's not here for a meeting or he's not here to, to be part of some initiative or progress. Uh, you do not see people of color very often. And if you do, it's very few and far between. I remember when Cito said he was going to teach out there. I said, really? I said, that's, a, that's awesome. I mean, but the, to the point to where we see people that look like us who speak like us, who came from Northside. And Ariel made that point that, you know, they'll get a few of color here just to give it a little Bob Ross thing, you know, boom, 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 boom. But then when they leave it, okay, they're gone. We did our part and it's and door closes again. Uh, you do not see that that welcoming feeling when you walk on campus. I, I took my grandson to the tree lighting two years ago. He had a blast. But when I was walking around, I was probably maybe three or four people of color that had children there that were walking around and we stuck out like a sore thumb. I mean, and, and I love it. He loved it. He loved the tree. You guys care to Santa Claus. But that's something that we need to start doing with our children. But if, if if I don't feel welcomed with him, and I used to work right up the street at Fort Worth ISD there, and they look at us or they kind of say, well, why is he really here? Or, or God forbid, I'm dressed in shorts and a t-shirt, and I really don't look like I need to be there because I don't look like an athlete. So they're not going to sit there and say this. And then there is no soccer team. So let, let's be honest about that, how we're prejudged and how we're thought of. And you know, they say that we're going to do, we're going to progress. We're going to, you know, we, we have people of color or we have uh, racial equity. And we talk about, you know, we have, uh, we have uh, Max and the, and the history classes and we have these discussions, but long-term, what is, what is, what is being offered? What is there? When can we do, the only time we get together in TCU when it's people of color is for a sporting event or because we're complaining about something. That's a really about it, you know? And why can't it be uh, like the 421? That's that's awesome. Let's see what we can do to get this motivated. You know, get this organized, and structured. But coming from Northside, coming coming from from a perspective of 90% Latino, and my father was born in 24 out there in 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 Fort Worth in Northside, and our history doesn't exist. We don't. We weren't there. The stockyards was built by a bunch of white people, but it had nothing to do with any people of color working in those slaughterhouses. And now that we moved across the street where we can stay and live, and all over the city, we're still not welcome only when it's convenient for them, you know, or if we start initiatives, what long-term, what, what are their long-term plans for this? Because institution, institutional racism lives in Fort Worth and lives on that campus, regardless of what anyone can tell me. 
And until we really open our doors and be honest with each other, there's, and I'll leave you, I'll stop, I'll, leave, I'll end with this. People say, well, what can we as people, you know, white people, what can we do to help? I said, you know what? They, we've been lied to and backstabbed all our lives. Until we get that trust factor and we can trust you that you'll be nice to me when you're around my, the people that I look like. But when I go to your meetings, you don't blow me off or act like you don't even know me or just barely say hi and, and walk off. The trust factor, that's what we need. Trust and loyalty. Because we are not, we're having gotten it not consistently. And until that really happens with the powers that be, we're not going to get anywhere, to be honest with you. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. G. Thank no, you, no, thank no, you. no, thank you, my brother. Thank you for sharing. And, um, you know, when you talk about making these connections with the history, COVID threw a wrench in some of our works, but we're talking about possibly building a summer um, you know, uh, research program, you know, for our youth, because what we want to do is cultivate um, this idea that our youth in high school, middle schools can see themselves doing what Jacinto is doing, doing what I'm doing, or doing what Marcellus is doing, or even doing what you're doing, which is speaking truth to power publicly. And so we want to um, you let our people know, and let our youth know that there's a space and place for them. And what we're going to do is see if we can't set it up for next summer. This summer is just, you know, we're not going to be able to do it. So, but this idea of, again, the, the links in the piece, please get, you know, like let's, let's just stay connected and stay in conversation so we can figure out how we can, um, you know, you know, incorporate all, all the right elements so that the youth get what they need. Um, I know we're just a little bit over time, but um, you know how it is, you know, we, we just like starting to warm up, it seems. Um, what about William or Dr. Trimble? Would, would either of you want to jump on in? Perkins, yes, Dr. Back? G, real quick, uh, I guess for me, I, as you can see here, who I work with is boots on the ground, parents. So we have youth program here and uh, I think Ricky or Cinto was uh, mentioned, um, you know, do the kids feel that uh, they're not wanted? Yes, I can, I, can, I can speak on their behalf here with the Artes de la Rosa Cultural Center um, that, that was the whole reason. We're the only Latino cultural center in Tarrant County. And, you know, as it relates to brown people here, um, you know, the, the history, uh, it, it, it seems to repeat itself. So um, I know that we're running short on time, you know, as, as the conversation was, we're going through here, as you can see here, there are mothers here of our future generations, leaders, okay? And, uh, you know, one in particular, uh, she had a comment in reference to the process, uh, you know, Cinto uh, reference to on the community scholars, you know, and when they go through the process, some do feel defeated, you know, it's like I'm not worthy to get into a local uh, university and have to go outside, you know, and, and it's interesting enough because I was part of a mayoral candidate forum earlier today and I asked about uh, I asked uh, one of the questions that I asked it was in reference to diversity inclusion uh, how they if whoever would be the mayor you know would advance it you know it was interesting you know if I get an opportunity go look at who actually answered and who went around <laughs> the question if you will but um, point being is uh, you were talking about having an event on site uh, as the conversation keeps going I also invite coming out to the community. I invite you, uh, we have, you know, you talked about space. We have a space here, you know, where you can come and speak to the community. We can do a community forum. Uh, some of the parents, they have dual jobs, you know, so it's sometimes it's tough depending on the schedules uh, that, that events are held. Uh, but if there's surveys, you know, anything that we can do, count on us on getting that, uh, that information out to. So you can listen directly from parents and community well, leaders. Well, you know, here's the thing. I told you I'm East Coast. So that means I'm a man of my word. It's just that simple. My email's in the chat. So uh, please email me so we can um, set it up. I'm more than willing to come on out to your center and meet the lovely parents. Because quite frankly, when you tell me, wait, wait let, let me see the parents, please. You know, we just can't. All right. Your children are welcome here. I am a professor at TCU, and so that means I can be your children's professor. If I'm here, there's a space for them as well. Okay, it's just that simple. And I, you know, I can't say much about what has been, but moving forward, if I'm here, there's a space for your children. 
right? You know, they, they, they deserve to learn and grow just like anybody else, just so, like anybody else. And so- My daughter is, is in, do we have, yeah, she's a seven-year-old. And she says her plans are go to TCU and either take William's job when he retires. Huh? You know, she was a double major in business and dance. Listen, so here's what I want to do. I mean, not, not only am I willing to come on out and talk to you in person, but, you know, once, you know, we get through this COVID thing, I, I, I want for your children to come on campus. You know, we can give them tours and show them the possibility of what can be because it hurts my, it hurts my feelings. I mean, again, I don't, I don't know TC. I mean, again, I, it's not like I, I graduated from TCU, but it still hurts my feelings to hear that our students don't feel comfortable on this campus. And that's wrong. You know, that, that's something we need to change, you know, because um, if anything, we're the ones who, who, who maintain the campus and keep it looking clean and, and, and beautiful and keep it running every day, right? There's so many of us who are hidden. Um, I'm a little bit more visible. Jacinto is a little bit more visible. Perkins is a little more visible. But the bottom line is there is no TC without us. It's, it's just that simple. So um, no, we, we, need to, we need to change that. And so that's what we need to continue talking about, how you know, we can make this truly an open campus. Well, anything we can do, we definitely, I'll take your email and we'll be corresponding for sure. And definitely believe me, we believe in uh, collaboration and making changes moving forward. Thank you. Okay, and last but not least, Dr. Trimble, did you wanna jump in, jump in as well? We also have one more person too, Dr. G. Oh, okay. We're going to go in that direction. Yeah, yeah I'll jump. I mean, I'll, I'll be. I would love to. Um, I'm the principal at JP Elder Middle School, which is in the middle of Northside. And so, if you ever need a space for to come and talk to kids, to come get our kids involved, I, they, I mean, I feel like if our kids knew someone on the campus when they got there, that they had an ally. So if we bring our our uh, education classes and they come and teach, whether they student teach or they just come and visit and meet our kids. When you walk into an uncomfortable space, if there's a friendly face that you know, you feel much more comfortable. And I think that would be huge for our kids on the North Side community. When they walk into TCU, it's not strangers. They, they know you, they see somebody. So if there's ever an opportunity or something that you need uh, at a middle school level, uh, I, I, can, I can make those arrangements and, and would love to start building those relationships to get these kids through Elder, through Northside, and then straight to TCU because that would have a huge impact on our community. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, Dr. G, I don't know if you have a, a follow-up, but um, I know that Florentio Aranda, I'm sorry if I pronounced your name incorrectly, correct me if so, but I see that, I see that you've been waiting patiently. Uh, with your camera on, so I definitely want to hand you the mic uh, so you can, can speak as well. Yeah, I just wanted to thank the RRI initiative and everyone, um, Dr. Jacinto Ramos and everyone who took part in today's discussion. I think it's very relevant, um, super needed. And, and one thing that really resonated with me was how do we work together to unite our communities? And, and, and in my I, I'm in my month three as the coordinator of diversity and inclusion initiatives here in the Office of Diversity and Inclusion. So if you all would like to collaborate, I'm, I'm all on board. That, that's why I was brought on. Um, this is what we can do. I shared my information not to make this about me, but to just show you that there's another brown man, uh, educated brown man willing to do the work, um, be on the ground and actually um, talk and walk. So I, I, I'm, I'm here. Um, I love that we're here sharing space. And I look forward to collaborating and work, working with each and every one of you. Awesome. Thank you. So I mean, in, in, in my closing comments, Dr. G, it's, I would hope that, you know, that our criteria is not so steeped in whiteness of, you know, brown people, coming in, showing up with an accent and speaking our truth about our, our community and our people, you know, that would get a legitimate shot at TCU. That's, that's my mindset. It's, you know, I have heard too many times of, well, I don't know that that kid could, you know, could really make it at TCU. I heard their accent. 
you know, or, or they're too militant or they're too much rooted in their Mexican-ish or Guatemalteco or Venezolano. Like, to me, that's whiteness showing up in, in that kind of an interview process. And like I said, you know, even if we follow the data about who's getting legitimate shots at TCU, you know what I mean? Like, it, we're the majority. Let me just put it that blankly and that honestly. Brown people are the majority in, this, in, in public school education in, in Texas. Latinos, Latinas, we're the majority. And, and I think that when more young people of other ethnic backgrounds are getting a legitimate shot at TCU, that's going to pit us against one another. I don't like that. I don't want that to happen. I don't want that to happen. And yet, if I follow the data, the way whiteness has taught me to do, I have a problem with that. So I'm kind of going to just put that out to the universe and then see what everybody says. Thank you, my brother. Ms. Perkins, uh, any, any closing words as well? Um, no, one, I just want to thank everyone for their time, energy, and effort for joining us on this town hall. Um, I'm, I'm a big believer in that community is built through honest conversation and transparency. Uh, Fort Worth exists in, I mean, I'm sorry, TCU exists within Fort Worth. Uh, it, TCU is not a bubble, even though it acts as if it is. Um, the, the streets intersect with the city of Fort Worth. Um, and I think that there needs to be more of an intentional job to bridge that gap. I mean, that this is this should be home. This, these resources should be available to the community members. Community members should feel welcomed and comfortable uh, enjoying walking through campus or applying or using resources, particularly our young scholars um, in these local high schools and middle schools. Uh, the doors should be open uh, for them to explore and use their imagination um, to, to, to learn and, and do better. Because what, what they do is they, they take that what they learn and they, they give it back to their community. And that only improves Fort Worth, that only improves Texas, that only improves the United States, that only improves uh, us in a global citizen aspect uh, when we open our doors and we allow uh, those that are around us to use what we have within us. Um, and, and with that being said, I, um, Doc, Dr. G put a link in the chat, which is the podcast Reconcile This, uh, where Dr. G and I uh, interview different members of our TCU community, and we should potentially uh, start looking into Fort Worth community leaders as well to kind of highlight these champions and trailblazers. Uh, so we'll be interviewing and having these conversations with people who do the work, not the people that are on the flyers you never see, but the people that do the work and, and you never hear about, um, that, that are actually on the ground level uh, day in and day out, uh, getting a chance to hear them, hear their perspective, hear their works and, and their reason why did they do it. Um, so that's all I have. And again, thank you all for your time, energy and effort. And I, I give it back to uh, Dr. G. No, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And um, I, I just think that when we look at this conversation, it's just that it's, it's, it's part of an ongoing conversation. And so I just want to say um, that we will uh, make more spaces and places to continue these conversations. Again, um, I appreciate Florencio, you know, putting himself out there. Again, my email is out there so we can make it happen with Artist de la Rosa, I'm willing to go out there. Same thing with JPL. Um, so let's continue to talk about how we continue to stay connected and build upon this. Because again, it's hard to solve the world, you know, um, you know, pressing issues in 75 minutes. But at the same time, who said we can't make the effort, right? So I'm very appreciative of all of you coming together to be in this space. Um, again, all of you are invited April 21st. Um, again, our email is out there, the website is out there in terms of if you have a question as far as what's going on, what's the latest, um, but we need to continue to stay connected, stay in community, stay in conversation. I really like this idea of us thinking about us, right? Black and brown as a unit, right? Can you imagine how powerful that would be? Ooh, can you just imagine how powerful that would be? If we get on the same page, this is, and, and maybe that's part of the, that, that's part of the point, right? You know, maybe, you know, it, it's kind of convenient that we, we don't see eye to eye if you, if you look at the way the system is designed. So maybe we um, can outthink the system, you know, and, and think about, you know, what we have in common, you know, as um, brothers and sisters in the struggle. And so um, I'm, I'm appreciative of being stimulated by this conversation because um, I, I know that um, you know, as we've done in the past, we've come together, 
and we will continue to come together to move forward together. And so I can't promise what will happen as a result of this race and reconciliation initiative, but I do pledge to you that we are doing the best we can with what we have. Thank you, and until next time. Thank you, Dr. G.